too illiterate to use IBM, so I have to use an Apple. But anyway, we got it all figured out. We're here today. We've just been one of those. I, I, I told Shelly, it felt like Friday, and she said, yeah, but remember the rest of the quote. Yeah. Yeah, Sunday's coming. I hope it's very up and get here. Uh, there was a Sunday school class that was uh, a Sunday school teacher that was bringing her class into the sanctuary one Sunday morning, and she stopped them in the foyer of the church, and she said to them, now kids, why is it important to remember that we must behave and be quiet in church? And one really bright kid said, because some of them are sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Never happens here. <laughs> uh, through the story, what we've been trying to do is to awaken the church to what God is up to. If you are busy with us for the very first time today, we are, uh, we are on chapter 29 of a 31-week journey through a verse of the Bible called The Story. Somebody close to you might have a hardback that looks a little different than this, but it will say the story on it. And what this is, is this is an abridged version of the Bible. It is not intended, this is not intended to replace this. This is a supplement, as you have been here before. This is a way for you and I to get a handle on the Bible that maybe we've never been able to when we've read it this way. And what's the difference? This is set up chronologically. It is in the order of history as things transpire. That is not true here. Sometimes you go back and forth and you get very confused about, huh? I thought I already read that. And you read it again. So this has put it in chronological order. Number two, this is not broken up into verses, all right? Different books, different chapters and verses. This reads like a history book or like a biography, all right? And so it's simply chapter 1 through chapter 31. There are some omissions in here, all right? And it's okay because it's not trying to replace the Bible. Where there are duplicates, the duplicates have been removed. Uh, where some things just don't have a, a great fit in the chronology of historical events. Some of the things out of the Song of Solomon. Not all the Psalms and Proverbs are included. But those that are, are included at the times in which they were written, all right? So that's what makes this a little different style of reading. And because we live in a period of time in which there is so much biblical illiteracy, we wanted to give people a solid footing on the Word of God to get the big picture of what the Bible and God's story is all about. And so two pastors worked very hard, Randy Frazee and Max Licato, in putting this together and making it available to churches, where as a church family, we can have a solid foundation on God's Word, and hopefully with a better understanding. And so if you're new today, let me just confirm a couple of things from our regular folks. Those of you who've been with us all 29 weeks up to now, how many have you, of you have stayed current in reading all the way through the Bible from chapter 29 today? Raise your hand. Okay, hold my mic. Look at that. Look at that. That's over half the congregations here. How many of you are close to being current with reading everything and are current? All of you. Together. Raise your hand. Right, look at that. That is awesome. We've never had that. How many of you would say... You have a better understanding of how things fit together now than you've had before. Raise your hand. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. That is worth it right there, folks. That is worth it. Now, here's the next question. Will you read it again once we finish it? Good. See, this could be a regular way of you doing uh, a read through the Bible every single year. It's follow up with this again and again. Well, in the story, we've tried to awaken you to what it is that God is up to. We are pursuing the story, and I don't want to lose any of you to sleep. God used Israel in the Old Testament to win people back to himself. Even though Israel failed in many ways, God's purpose for the nation of Israel was not that God was selective and only like people who were Israelites, but God chose a man and a woman, Abraham and Sarah, a childless old couple, and said, out of you, I'm going to perform a miracle. Going to give you descendants of the sand and the sea and the stars and the sky. And what was the purpose of building this Israel? Was so the rest of the world could know who God was and they could have a relationship with God as well. And that's what the Old Testament really is all about God working through Israel to share his story with the rest of the world. And then we got to the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in the Gospels, we read about God sending his son to the world, Jesus Christ. For what purpose? very same purpose as Israel in the Old Testament was Jesus in the Gospels. 
to win all of us back into a relationship with his heavenly Father. And Jesus Christ did this by dying on the cross and taking care of and solving the big problem that all of us have. What's our big problem? Sin. You guys, you're good. Sin. Why don't we like to talk about sin? It's convicting. It makes us feel guilty. How about the fact that I is right in the middle of sin? We have to own it. We have to own it ourselves. Sin is my problem. Sin is your problem. Your sin is not my problem. I have more than enough of my own. And my sin is not your problem. You have enough of your own. But we all have to speak fire of sin. And the death of Jesus Christ took care of our big problem. Then in the book of Acts that we introduced to you last week, and the New Testament epistles, where we're going to kind of just do a quick skim today, we see where God now uses the church. The church. That's you and me. It's not this building called New Hope and the building just down the street called New Covenant and the building just down the street well, between us called uh, family, God's Family Church. Uh, and it's not the building called The Well and it's not the building called The Church of Christ. I'm trying just to stay on the east. We got a bunch of them. Must be a lot of sinners to travel down the east. I mean, up until then, 
Now, Robert Hutchinson Sr. was here, it would look a little different than it did three weeks ago. And cut the ends of a couple off, all right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's missing. And that's it. It's going to take a while to get used to it. We don't like missing any of you. It takes us a while to get used to it. God hates it when we're MIA. Now, here's another reason. Do you think Robert would have said, well, I'm glad to give up that finger, but I think we've given up this finger. Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see 
nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus for three days blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. You know, I find it interesting. The day that Jesus took our sin into his own life, the world got dark. The day that Jesus tried to enter into Saul's life, the world got dark. Jesus experienced his three days. Saul's experience without food, without water, without sight for three days. Well, in the basket, there was a disciple named Ananias, part of the new church, all right? The Lord called to him in the vision, Ananias, yes, Lord. <clears throat> the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord! I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people of Jerusalem. He's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And God said to Ananias, go. Let me ask you. God asked you to go to a man who wants to kill you. Would you be interested in being a missionary? <laughs> that was the call on Ananias. And aren't we all glad that Ananias went and saw Paul? This most unlikely missionary, most unlikely to be the, the point leader for spreading the church, as Abraham was the most unlikely candidate to be a father of the great nation, old China. But God did it. Why? Because there's no other explanation for God for how Abraham became the father of the nation of Israel. It was as unlikely as Sarah Boyle becoming a rock star in Britain. <laughs> Saul of Tarsus was the Osama bin Laden of Christianity in the very first century. And God does this throughout the story in order to direct glory to himself. He takes most unlikely things. He sent this out. The Ananias, he said, go. To you, to you, to you. Even Paul Saul, who became Paul, was amazed that Jesus chose him as a missionary to the ends of the earth. On page 427, Paul sort of relates his own surprise. Last paragraph. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not deserve to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I now am what I am, and his grace to me was not without
illustrated the book of Acts, Paul went on three missionary journeys. All right? Now, missionaries did different things in those days than they do now. They didn't go to one country and stay forever. Okay? Paul went to many different countries, many different cities. In the time period of the book of Acts in the Bible, he went on three missionary journeys. He planted ten churches. He wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. So he was very active, all right, in his work in carrying out the Great Commission. Now, according to the story, the book of Galatians, all right, which if, if there is one book in the New Testament, I have to say, all you can do is read one book. The one book I probably would say to read would be either Galatians or Ephesians, all right? Galatians or Ephesians, two of the, the, the best comprehensive epistles that, that Paul wrote. And the book of Galatians is very, very significant. Now, I don't want to don't go to sleep on it. <laughs> do I need to have you stand and stretch for a moment? So I'm going to do now a little history lesson. And history can sometimes get boring. Shouldn't be, but it gets out of here sometimes. See, the book of Galatians was written about the same time that Acts chapter 15 events are taking place. Acts chapter 15 is the story of the Jerusalem Council. All right? It's a big church meeting. All right? Those of us who are part, have been part of denominations in our past, we know about district meetings. All right? Uh, we know about state meetings, national conventions, and that's where leaders of the churches in a district, in a state, in a country all get together, and they work through one of the challenges that we are facing. Well, you've got to understand, before Acts chapter 1, there was nothing called a church. There wasn't one church. All right? Now, all of a sudden, you got churches being planted by Peter and Paul and James, and there's these churches sprouting up all over the place. And, uh, of course, going down my sleeve is annoying me. Okay, here we go. Um, I started making comparisons because I might end up in trouble the way that Robert got in trouble when he preached. So, okay. Go for it, Tim. Do it. I don't want to go to Junior High.
that, that really was the argument they dealt with back then. Now, some of the Jewish leaders said Gentiles in those days had to do two things to become true Christians. And we will all will agree on the first one. Everybody must believe in Jesus Christ to become a true Christian. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. We got agreement on that one. Here's the deal. Folks in those days should have put a period right there instead of a cold. Today, we need to put a period right there. What makes them a Christian? What they know. To believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Period. No cold. But they put a cold up, and then that three-letter destructive word, and. And. Here's what they add. And you must be circumcised. First off, I'm a little sick over this. Because you women got off on that council from the Scott Creek. Okay? Uh, you didn't have to go through any of that. All right? Now, what they were asking was that I, as a grown man, as a Gentile, let's say I'm 35, I might say I'm 35, say I'm 35 and I become a Christian, and then other folks say, you know, if you're going to be a real Christian, you will get circumcised. It's like you and I say, you're going to become a real you got to be a church, 51 out of 52 seconds. If you're going to be a real Christian, you have to dress differently. If you're going to be a true Christian, you have to shave your head. If you're going to be a true, true Christian, you got to, you can't go to some of the movies. If you're going to be a true Christian, you can't smoke, drink, or chew, or run with the world Jews. <laughs> Gentiles did not have to submit to Jewish law. In fact, Jews did not have to submit to Jewish law to be a Christian anymore. All right? They were saved now by circumcision of the heart and not the circumcision of the flesh. And Paul's book of Galatians argues for the reasons behind this strategic decision. Page 430 in the story. Page 430 or Galatians chapter 3. And the middle paragraph. Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the work of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by the Spirit that you're now trying to finish by the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain that it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you His Spirit to work miracles among you by the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? 431, second paragraph, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And then one more paragraph down, the acts of the flesh. Are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The acts of the flesh are in opposition to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. Since we live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Why? Because we are one body. Does my left foot say, I wish I was the right foot? Does my right knee say, I want to be an elbow? No, the right knee is just glad I got an elbow so I can bend down there and scratch it. Okay? We are here for each other's benefit. But are we living the life under acts of the flesh, which you and I do all on our own. Or do we display the fruit of the Spirit? What can you do to produce the fruit of the Spirit? How about just hang with God? That's all you do. Okay? A break is out there on the windows. Okay? Look the windows when you come in. Here's the vine. Then you see the branches with some leaves on it. Then you see more leaves. And then the last, the last window out there has got big clusters of grapes on it. What did the branch do to produce the grapes? It just hung on the vine. You see, the scripture says, the branch abides in the vine. It will bear much fruit. It is the life of the vine displaying itself through the branch. It is God in you, His life in us, flowing through.
listen to the end of the third so important to us? Because the vast majority of us here today are Gentiles. Aren't you glad that the blood of Jesus Christ and God's plan extended to all of us? If we are a believer in Christ, somebody told us about God's plan. That took a missionary. It took a missionary of one kind or another to share with you who Jesus Christ is. Who was your very first missionary in your life? For me, it was my parents. The time I was about four days old, I was in church. I heard my parents talk about it at the field time, at dinner time, sitting around with friends. I heard about the gospel all through my life. At the age of five and a half, they call preaching with a southern girl by the name of Littlewood, preached the message so simple that a five and a half year old boy, it seems like this one can't bring understood enough to be able to walk forward, bow and all, and admit that he was a sinner. I did a pretty big thing. <laughs> but I knew it not. And I wanted Jesus to live in my life and raise my life. Since then, other missionaries continued to tell me about who Jesus was and how Jesus wanted to live in my life. Some of those missionaries were a woman named Martha White, who used to sit right over there at the end of that view. Where her husband, she now lives in Arizona. At the time I was in the first to the third grade, she was talking about her life. And then another woman who used to sit at our table and got any thoughts here was Helen Bronstein from fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. She told me about her love of Jesus. And then when I got to junior high, a woman by the name of Nancy Lou, whose daughter Janet is still a part of our church in the Arizona She took a teenage boy, showed him, and taught him how much Jesus Christ loved him. You remember the first missionary in your life? Do you remember who it was that was not ashamed of the gospel and shared with you the power of salvation? The book of Acts, it's our story. The Acts of the Apostles is to be the Acts of our local church called New Hope. And this is where we fit into God's story. The book of Acts is still being written today in your life and mine as we breathe his life and his truth in the community of Fresno and Clovis. The mission of the church in Acts is the mission of our church today. We are to be Jesus in our Jerusalem. We are to be Jesus in our Judea. We are to be Jesus in our Samaria. And we are to be Jesus to the uttermost parts of our earth. It would just happen this week for New Hope as folks were in Columbia. It happened twice earlier this year as two different folks on two different trips went to the Ivory Coast of Africa. It happened with our high school group as they went to the barren parts of Arizona to the Navajo Indian Reservation. And I pray that we as a church family will not fear, allow fear from newspaper articles to keep us from going back to Mexico with our high school group this spring and taking to a needy family and a needy community the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that is our call. who calls us to go to the utter, most heart of the earth. And guess what, folks? That's our mission until we take our very last breath. Or until somebody chops our head off. And that's what we'll find out happens with Paul next week. Next week's chapter. Let me wrap this up. <coughs> We've not dived into a lot of the details in the Bible. We focused on the upper level of God's story as we made this journey through the scriptures. We've been trying to figure out what God is up to. Right from the very first page, we got the idea that God was up to something. That he has a vision and a passion to be with us. Our representatives, Adam and Eve, they chose a different vision, and their choice injected sin into their human nature, and it has been transmitted to every human being since then, separating us from God. And that was just chapter 1 of the story. The rest of the Bible tells us the story of the extent and the lengths that God will go to to get us back, the relentless pursuit of God for us. The Bible is divided into two books. What are they called? Old Testament and New Testament. And God's plan is to get us back and it began with a group of people in the Old Testament called Israel. Good. All right. Through Israel, he reveals himself and his solution, which is Jesus Christ. And in the first four books of the New Testament, and they are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Oh, the brave hearts got in on John. We read the story of Jesus' own life. His objective is clear. He is going to represent us. The one who knew no sin became our sin, that we might become and inherit his righteousness. The sin which had been injected into Adam and Eve by their own free will. All of the sins of all of humanity injected into that perfect human spirit and soul of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. And he who knew no sin now became sin, separated from the presence of his heavenly Father, so that you and I one day can inherit his perfection, his righteousness. The body hasn't arrived yet. Just let Veneer know perfection has been. The 
Christ died on the cross, all of our sins, past, present, and future, were taken care of. Those who reach out and grab this free gift are forgiven by God's forgiveness. God has wanted that all along. You can quote John 3.16 with me, can't you? For God is a love of the world, and he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but has ever been passing. Now the question is, who is going to take the message of Jesus and what he has done to the rest of the world? Starting the book of Acts and continuing to the end of the Bible of Revelation, God establishes his church that you and I are a part of. He established us to carry out his commission. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other part of the The church needs all hands on hand to get this mission accomplished. I wish I had the time, but I don't this morning, but I'm going to give you a, a, a I'm going to give you something to Google. I want you to I want you to Google when you have the opportunity. Um, 10 Christians to watch in the Olympics. Just Google that. And you'll come up with two sites. Two different articles were written. One before the Olympics started. And number two, the next one is uh, 10 Christians at the Olympics who won medals. And I tell you what, there are some great, great stories. These are men and women at the Olympics who are part of our church, the Church of Jesus Christ. And they are using the platform of the Olympics, whether in victory or in defeat, to share they're not ashamed of the gospel. But it's the power of salvation for my others to say. Kevin Durant said, my relationship with God makes me a better person, and I want to try to grow. Sonia Richards and Tracton, and she's a stud. He said, I know that it's only God that gives me the strength to accomplish anything found. The guy, Jonathan Horton, he was in the Olympics. Jennifer Nichols, an archer. Oh, do I love this girl. May her try to preach. She was 27 years old. Listen to this. I saved my first kiss for the man I knew I was going to marry, and I just kissed him this year. 27 years old. She said, I'm excited to be able to offer whatever I can to glorify the Lord and what I do. Uh, how about Gabby? Yeah, it's all right. That cute little, oh man, she just makes me smile every time you see her. And she just loved that. She said, I didn't pray for the first time before I competed. She tweeted. You know what she tweeted? Before she won her last goal? Let all that I am praise the Lord and I never forget the good things she does. That might be a good substitute for prayer time. Missy Franklin, David Boudia, I don't know if I said his name right, last night just won gold off the 10, uh, 10 millimeter platform, all right? What? what? Meter. Meter. 10, yeah, no, no, I leave it in the Maybe I should dive off the board. <laughs> to an empty pool. He <laughs> said, whatever happens at the end of this Olympic game is out of my control. God is sovereign and everything. There are so many. What did they do? They were not ashamed of the gospel. They were like they were part of the church. I pray that they can go do it every four years when they look to go around. I hope that that's part of our life every day. That one will be part of the church and part of mine. Do um, you realize what you really are part of? Gosh. God loves you.